All right, now, before I fully hand it over, I just wanna say how excited I am to get into this presentation today. I had the good fortune to be able to preview the content last week, and I've been telling everyone about it ever since. Carissa, Ryan, and Jeff are definitely leaders in this field, and they've got great ways to measure innovation, which everybody wants to know what about. They've got great ways to tell stories, and the best part is it's, a lot of this has been proven repeatable both by them, but also I think it's stuff that people can take home and use and adopt in their own programs. So without further ado, I'll hand things off to our NASA team to introduce themselves. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jessica. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Aclini, and as Jessica mentioned, we have Ryan Stewart and Jeff Doy on the phone as well. And we are the NASA team that owns and operates NASA at Work. Uh, NASA at Work is NASA's internal crowdsourcing platform, and it has been on IdeaScale for about a year now, and we are sharing some of our best practices here with you today. So thank you so much for joining us. So we are part of NASA's Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation. And when we were first stood up back in 2011, we were asked by the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy to not only bring open innovation to NASA, but across the federal government. So we do a lot of work within NASA, but we also work with other federal agencies like DHS, EPA, NIST, just to name a few. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, we can definitely connect with you. Um, but today we are uh, really talking about NASA at work. Next slide. So we mentioned we engage with the public in crowdsourcing, but we also want to engage with our own workforce. So at NASA, we have 60,000 people who love to solve problems. So we absolutely want to tap into them and their ideas and their knowledge. Um, so our platform is primarily used to promote uh, knowledge sharing and idea generation across the not know this, but NASA is broken up to up into 10 different field centers across the country, which can present both a geographic and cultural difficulties at times. Um, so one of the drivers to having a tool like NASA at work was to get people out of their silos, talking and engaged and innovating on NASA problems. So just a note for today, um, you'll hear us use the word challenge, and you'll see it also on our screen. <laughs> um, so in idea skill speak, this is synonymous with campaign. So if you hear us use the word challenge, uh, what we're talking about is a, a campaign. So just a note on that. Next slide, please. So anyone with NASA credentials can participate on NASA at work. So for that, for us, that is uh, civil servants and contractors. Uh, we work with our technical and non-technical teams to turn their problems into challenges. So they become like mini competitions with requirements and judging criteria. Here's an example of one uh, that we have on uh, the platform right now. So for each challenge, we award up to two winner winning ideas with non-monetary awards. And there's two main ways to participate. Um, you can either be a challenge owner, so you bring your problem to us and we turn it into a challenge, or you can be a solver, so you're the person that submits your idea. There's no charge to use NASA at work for any of our teams, it's free. Uh, the un only investment is people's time, so the time it takes to answer a question or the time it takes to, takes to work through the problems. And uh, I'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Uh, Ryan, Jeff, and I are the administrators of NASA at work, but more than that, we're the community curators and protectors of our NASA crowd. Um, we see the big picture of how the community responds to challenges and what engages them. And we're really the gatekeepers uh, to make sure that whatever we post on NASA at work isn't just fluff, but meaningful to NASA and the community and is going to be used in the future. So one of our first best practices we want to share with you today is we are Sherpas. <laughs> we literally hold people's hand through the process and remove as much friction as possible. So if you take nothing else away from today, remember to be a Sherpa. <laughs> it is our biggest and best, uh, best practice uh, for the success of our crowdsourcing platforms. Um, when something is new, there's an automatic resistance for people to try it, right? Because they think it might be too hard, it might take too much time, they're just not sure, and that becomes a wall and a barrier in their mind. So anything you can do to remove those barriers, remove the walls, will help in the success of your program. 
Our potential challenge owners come to us mainly through roadshows that we do when we talk to different groups about crowdsourcing. Um, but a lot of times they come to us through from people that have heard of us or they've had a friend try it and they want to try it. Um, so the human network is a very powerful thing when it comes to adoption, especially for crowdsourcing. So when we talk to our potential challenge owners, we always start with a one-on-one -on -one discussion on their idea. Try and get out of the challenge. This is also the time when we make sure we set expectations with them that they need to be a huge part of the participation throughout the challenge. So it's not like we put it together, throw it on the platform and that's it. Like they have to be engaged. Engagement is huge and critical to success. Um, it seems intuitive, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, we know that when our challenge owners interact and comment on, on ideas, they are more likely to get better and, and more ideas um, just from that interaction. It's like the crowd knows when the owners are engaged and listening and they will participate way more uh, when they see that. So it's that easy. Um, we also have a whole host of resources on our platform for our challenge owners to reference, including how to be a challenge owner, how the ch challenge process process works, training videos, all kinds of things um, we have available for them as well. Next slide, please. So LASSO, and it's not just because we are in Texas. <laughs> LASSO is an acronym for a challenge definition technique that what was taught to us by an incentive and that we still use today. So one of the first things we do in our, our initial discussions is to deter determine if the challenge is a good fit for NASA at work or any of our tools. So we have a challenge worksheet that helps us facilitate that discussion. And within that worksheet, we ask things like, what's the background of the problem? Are there any constraints? What requirements they have? Um, what do they hope to get out of the challenge? What have they tried in the past? So just, we, just so we know some background um, so that we can choose the best challenge option for them. You know, through this discussion, we may find that their entire problem isn't challengeable, if that's a word, <laughs> but maybe there's a piece of it that is, and we focus on that piece. So specifically for NASA at work, we make sure all our ch challenges meet our LASSO criteria. So L, limited in scope. So the time it takes someone to answer the challenge should be an hour or less. Um, so they can be able to do it on their lunch break or in between projects. Um, and this is very specific for NASA at work, that time constraint. It must be actionable. So if successful, the challenge owner can take these ideas and do something with them. They can take them forward, move them forward. It has to be specific enough that anyone that is participating can contribute with their own knowledge and skill set. So they don't need a team or an army <laughs> to try to solve the problem. It has to be supported or and owned, meaning that management supports the use of NASA at work and the use of challenges, and that the team that comes to us is really the true owner of the problem so that they can take the ideas and move them forward. So we never allow challenges that are solved that help solve other people's problems. So you may run into that. Do not let that happen. <laughs> it, is, it is not good because that team will not be able to move the ideas forward. So only solve problems that you own. So sometimes we have to help articulate the problem statement to get a challengeable piece. Um, so just as an example of what I'm talking about, um, we had a team that wanted a prototype for a waterless laundry system. So this was not a good fit for NASA work for many reasons, <laughs> but mainly because it would take way too much time. Um, a system is very complex, and especially if you're talking a prototype, I mean, that they're just asking for free labor, which does not fly on NASA at work. Um, so instead, if we turn that into what are some ideas you have for doing laundry in space, uh, people could share their ideas without the expectation of a time-consuming prototype or having to figure out the whole system. So there's, there's ways you can, can change the problems to make it work. And one of the value adds of our team, um, which makes us a little unique, is that if the problem isn't a good fit for NASA at work, we have other challenge options available to people as an alternative, and we can help guide them through those as well. So that's just a little... So our typical challenge timeline is about two months from challenge start to awarding winners. Um, and a little bit before that is the engagement piece of getting started, right? And so, um, and that can take anywhere from a week to several months to a year, <laughs> depending on a lot of factors. Sometimes it's time, sometimes it's politics within a group, but, uh, all kinds of reasons. Um, so one of our best practices is continual follow-up 
with potential challenge owners. Um, and it takes time and effort, but is well worth it because we, there's some challenge owners that we've talked to for years before they actually run a challenge. Um, but in the end, we eventually get there. We start uh, the challenge draft with the owner and we set up all the workflows and get everything set up on idea scale. Uh, our best practice is to keep a challenge open for four to six weeks. Um, this gives people time to think, which is important, but it also allows for vacation and other things that might get in the way of them seeing it. Um, and we've seen most participation happen when our notifi notifications go out, which is usually when the challenge launches and then right before it closes. So that's something else to keep in mind as you run communication. So once the challenge is over, we work with the challenge owner to identify up to two winners. Uh, the number of winners has actually evolved over time with our experience as well. Uh, we didn't used to have that cap immediately. Uh, we used to award basically at the challenge owner's discretion. And over time, we realized we needed a good balance between recognizing good ideas but not recognizing too many people to where it doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, so in the end, we settled on up to two winners with the option to not award at all. Um, so that may sound surprising, but um, this actually helps reduce the stress on our challenge owners, especially if it's their first time running a challenge so that they don't feel that pressure to you must award. Um, but we always encourage awarding whenever possible. Next slide, please. Because these are challenges, we have prizes and awards at, at the end of each challenge, which is exciting. <laughs> so this is also something our team manages. Um, each, of our, each of our NAFTA at Work winners receives a printed at Work certificate signed by our prizes and challenges executive and a NAFTA at Work innovator pin, which you can see pictured on this slide. Um, a big best, best practice of ours is we notify winners with an email as well as a separate email to their management. So we do a lot of research with Harvard, and one of the things that we looked at specifically was engagement on NASA at work. And we found that management recognition was statistically the key motivators that we tested. So management recognition was the biggest one on top um, compared to things like participating in the mission, recognition from peers, private recognition. Uh, none of those came close to management recognition. <laughs> so that has become a big part of our process. Uh, we believe in it so much that we've also started notifying our challenge owners managers as well uh, to recognize them because they are really the true heroes um, for the, uh, of this whole process for us. Um, they're trying something new. They're engaging with the NASA work community. And, you know, it takes a little bit of vulnerability to admit that you need help solving a problem, especially if maybe you're seen as an expert. Um, so, like I said, we want to acknowledge the true heroes of this whole process. And so we started recognizing them as well. Our, uh, so in addition to the certificate and the PIN, we also offer an award, um, which is also pretty unique to NASA. So these are things that we actually crowdsourced from the community. We wanted to know what they would value as a non-monetary award. Um, and what we ended up with is a tiered system uh, so that every time you win a challenge, you unlock a cooler prize. <laughs> and these are things like astronaut autographs, lunch with the center director, items that have been flown in space, tweets from astronauts. Um, so we have a, a whole list of things, if you're interested, that we can share with you. Um, but those are probably the, the coolest ones that I've mentioned. Um, since we are a mix workforce as civil servants and contractors, non-monetary awards work really well for us since anyone could win one. Um, if you do choose to award money, our recommendation would be just to be clear in the evaluation criteria. Um, I think people, for whatever reason, get maybe more attached or emotional when it comes to money. <laughs> so you just want to be crystal clear uh, so that every, everyone understands um, how a winner is going to be determined and why. Next slide, please. So after our winners are notified, we also have a short closeout uh, call with our challenge owners just to hear how the challenge went and the solutions they received, what they thought of them, how they're going to use them, and how much of an impact the challenge made toward their project. Um, so for impact, our definition is how far the idea moved their project forward. And we capture this in labor and materials they would have used or spent using an alternative method. So if they hadn't run our, the NASA Work Challenge, what would they have done alternatively? Um, most of the time, it's they would have used existing resources. 
Um, sometimes it's, they would have tried to start a new contract or subcontract or something like that. Um, so we just try to capture that as best we can and put a quantifiable, a quantifiable amount to it. Um, so if it's, if it's something like they would have had an engineer work on it for half time for, you know, six months or something like that, anything we can do to kind of quantify that amount, uh, we try to do. Um, during this call, this is also a time where we try to share lessons learned. So if there's anything that um, popped up during the, the process, maybe we could have done something a little bit different. We always want to learn those things as well. So another best practice um, is that we follow up with our challenge owners in a year after the challenge has been completed. Um, so sometimes these things take a while to percolate <laughs> and get implemented. So we always want to follow up in a year, two years, sometimes three years. Um, just to see how far the ideas have gone and um, because this part is really critical to know how the story ends for each of these challenges. So we've talked about a lot of work <laughs> that we do for NASA at work, you know, daily operations, working with challenge owners and curating our NASA internal crowd. And even though there's three of us on this call, we probably have only about one and a half people who work on NASA at work full time. So we, we have a lot of piece parts going other places. Um, but yeah, so we have about one and a half people that work on NASA work full time in case folks are interested in knowing that. And with that, I will hand it over to Ryan. All right, thanks, Krista. So we found that uh, one of the most important parts of our job and really our primary means of outreach has been showing the value of open innovation and particularly crowdsourcing. Since it's not traditional and it's new for many, if not most, proving to them the benefits of crowdsourcing has been very important. And the best story, the better stories that we can tell, the more likely we are to get buy-in and then have those folks take advantage of our tools. We've primarily done this via case studies, which we've built up over the years, and in addition to some particularly intriguing ones from outside industry. Next slide. And the punchline to those case studies have been our metrics. So we found that keeping lots of relevant data about your crowd, problems, solutions, successes, and failures allows for us to craft the right story for each audience. Some popular ones for us are success rate, cost savings, and uh, the number of challenges. And in a little bit, um, I'll, I'll give you some more examples of some of the important metrics that we gather. <clears throat> but the important thing here is that uh, for the metrics that you do capture, um, you need to think about uh, what is important for your stakeholders and your potential challenge owners and uh, make sure that you're diligent about capturing them for everything that you do. Next slide. Okay, um, so the next few slides are examples of some case studies that we share in our roadshows for prospective users of our tools. They rely on the successes that have occurred on NASA at work and hopefully make the otherwise confusing process of turning your problem into a challenge a little more clear through some examples. You'll notice how we focus on the problem owner with the intention of, uh, like Carissa said, celebrating that they took that leap to use the NASA, to use NASA at work, but also to hopefully help those watching uh, think of their own problems, which then might be applicable on the platform. We're really trying to view these from the perspective of the problem owner turned challenge owner, since they're very relatable, uh, just another engineer or scientist or what have you trying to get the best work done for NASA, probably not unlike the people that will be watching our roadshow when we present these. So for this challenge, uh, Robert Peterzik was looking for better ways to measure urine volume and microgravity. His team was prepared to spend over a million dollars in multiple years of development working on this project, and then they decided to check with the NASA work crowd first. He ended up finding a solution uh, that was a working prototype that was developed for a different purpose in a lab that was only 300 yards away from his desk. And so NASA at work was able to break through the silos that were occurring not just at NASA, but even within Johnson Space Center itself. And so a savings of over a million dollars in three plus years is pretty significant. But the fact that he was able to find a solution for free that was only 300 yards away is just as intriguing as those savings. And these are the kinds of things that we're looking for when we're talking about capturing metrics. We want the data, the hard numbers, but we also want the stories that they have to tell how NASA at work was able to connect these two teams that otherwise were working in silos is a strong story. And you'll see that uh, this theme comes up often, even in just a few case studies and um, I've included today's examples. Next slide. So this case study is similar in that someone at NASA was ready to spend a good bit of money to solve a problem, 
right, but decided to test the waters on NASA at work first. Just like Robert, Camille found a solution which already existed within NASA, this time at a different center, uh, saved her and the taxpayers millions of dollars. Next example. Next slide. And Tracy Gill from uh, Kennedy Space Center uh, was looking for ideas uh, for how to wash produce in space. Uh, this was a problem on the International Space Station and will continue to be a problem as we go to further space destinations. And in running his NASA at Work Challenge, he found solutions from a team which he was already working with on a different project. Neither had realized that they could collaborate on this problem until they met again on NASA at Work. So here's an example where our internal crowdsourcing platform broke the silos that were occurring between two coworkers, which is pretty amazing. Next slide. All right, so those uh, three were examples of technical problems. However, we can also take advantage of non-technical needs. Uh, this was a graphic challenge we did earlier this year, which ended up being our challenge with the most crowd interaction, and on top of that produced some pretty high quality graphics. Something that stands out about this project was the subject matter. We found out that uh, we can get the best interaction from our crowd when the challenges are about cool things uh, which the crowd cares about. So in this case, a Gateway is a big program, which is a major part of NASA's current effort to take humans to the moon and to Mars. And NASA people are really happy to take part in anything to do with this. Uh, that's why we came to NASA in the first place to do these kind of things. Uh, but just because you work at NASA, though, doesn't necessarily mean that you have a job where it feels like your tasks are directly helping us get to the moon and to Mars. So a challenge like this helps those people feel more tied to the mission. And so uh, your goal um, wherever you work is to try to mimic this concept, tying challenges to the things that people care about. And things uh, like catchy challenge titles, good challenge logos on the platform, uh, and in your outreach emails, uh, in addition to the subject matter, go a long way as well. So back to the metrics real quick. Um, so here's an example where we're able to include both the impressive crowd interaction data, uh, such as you know, the number of ideas, number of comments, number of votes, but also with some of the comments themselves that people made about the solutions. And so we were able to pull these um, off the platform. Um, and these comments were off the platform and uh, we thought these were particularly representative of what the crowd thought about the challenge and it helps personalize this data and you know, show that these things were submitted by real people and appreciated by real people. Next slide. So in addition to the case studies, uh, we also like to highlight aspects of our platform as a whole, as people wanna know that the interesting case studies aren't isolated to successes. So metrics such as our crowd size, number of challenges that we've ran, uh, success rate, uh, when we define success rate as at least incremental advancement in a solution, and the percentage of solutions implemented, percentage of challenges which result in cost savings, the average cost savings and in that total cost savings. Uh, these are all helpful metrics to display the effectiveness of our tool overall. We also find that being able to repeat these numbers from memory is just as important. Frequently we'll find ourselves in conversation uh, with people in the cafeteria or some, some management somewhere and we'll end up talking about our crowdsourcing tools, uh, inevitably having to explain crowdsourcing, open innovation and the benefits because the average person that we interact with doesn't already know that. Uh, and knowing things like implemented or planned to be implemented soon, 83% uh, of our challenges have cost savings with an average cost savings of 80%. Uh, these things really speak for themselves and data like this goes a long ways to getting buy-in. Next slide. Uh, so capturing and maintaining all this data can be difficult though, especially if you're running hundreds of campaigns. And so to help, uh, we recommend that you utilize a tool or some combination of tools where you can store, aggregate, and reference this data. So pictured here is Salesforce, which we use to capture pretty much all the data we need for each campaign. Uh, we also utilize Google Sheets to aggregate and view the data. You can use whatever tools you want, but we see these tools as an essential part of the storytelling process. If you're not easily able to aggregate and view the data, then like what good is capturing the metrics in the first place? Next slide. So lastly, we just wanna show you some other ways in which we can uh, portray, which we portray our information about our tools. So uh, what information is presented and how we present it differs pretty significantly for us, depending on the audience. So here we're highlighting information about our NASA at Work platform, uh, breaking down our success rate and highlighting 
how many of the users would uh, utilize a challenge again. Something like this may speak to a group who we think may need to be convinced uh, that their project is likely to, like, likely to succeed on the platform, maybe don't care as much about cost savings. Next slide. Uh, here we're giving a very brief uh, but informative look at the success we've seen from all our tools combined, uh, not just NASA at work. You can go back a slide. Uh, this one really gets to the point uh, in pretty much uh, every roadshow that we present. Uh, it's very, very succinct, but um, important data. Next slide, please. So something like this uh, helps show all the different types of challenges that we've done and can do. Uh, the idea here is to hopefully list a challenge type that registers as familiar with whomever we are presenting to, <clears throat> while also showing that we have both a deep and wide breadth of experience. We have many versions of these charts but wanted to highlight some different ways which we found to effectively communicate what we do and the successes that have come from such. And you'll notice that none of these slides would have had any value had we not been diligent to record metrics in the first place. So lastly, I can speak to you as someone who was only recently converted as a believer, and it was in large part because of these metrics with which I was presented. I started my role in COSI in November having never interacted with these tools, but after seeing the case studies of things like saving you know, millions of dollars, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, connected teams from different organizations who weren't otherwise talking, or, you know, positive outcomes of 90 plus percentage of the time, I couldn't deny the successes that open innovation was having. And so uh, <laughs> metrics like uh, are the things that won me over and continue to do so uh, for our current challenge owners and hopefully for our challenge owners in the future. And uh, with that, I'll go back to Chris. Huh? Thanks. Uh, so just to summarize some of the things we talked about today. Um, so in summary, be a Sherpa. <laughs> Help your people through the process. Take away the friction. Just be a Sherpa. Um, choose the right problems. Make sure they fit your platform. So be picky. It's okay to be picky. Um, use a challenge worksheet. So have a tool that helps you facilitate conversations so that you can get to the right problem. Find the right incentives for your community. Find out what they value um, and want to be rewarded with. Follow up after the challenge. Uh, find out what has been implemented what it mean, and what it means to your challenge owner. I think that's the most important thing. So like Ryan was talking about with metrics, you know, that really is the piece that can help tell the story. What value did the challenge bring to the challenge owner and how did it move the project forward? So capture the metrics. Um, have the the most that have the most potential to speak to stakeholders and use them. Um, so like Ryan said, we capture lots and lots of metrics, um, but, and we use them in different ways to tell different data stories to different audiences. So it's okay to capture a lot. You don't have to use them all the time. Um, you'll probably most likely use them in different ways um, as we mentioned and be willing to evolve all parts of this as you gain experience. So you heard us mention that uh, multiple times. There's been quite a few things that we've changed throughout the years. Um, I think, uh, and that's totally fine. You know, that's totally okay. I think it keeps things fresh. It keeps the program growing and it keeps people interested. So with that, last slide. So again, thank you so much for your time today. And if there's any questions, we're happy to answer them or feel free to reach out to us by email. And we'll also be at Open Nation so we can talk to you then. Thank you so much, guys. That was even more fun the second time through. You know. One of the key insights that I realized that I, I got that I think is unique to your approach is you're, everybody's focused on the, the innovator and the experience of the innovator, the person who brings the winning idea. But you guys are also focused on the vulnerability of the challenge owner, uh, the person who like, has to be vulnerable enough to say, like, I can't do this on my, no my own. I have this problem to solve. Like, you've got a lot of empathy for them as well. And I, I think that that's probably one of the reasons why you guys are so successful at this as well. Lots of other great insights, but we've got some questions already coming in. So um, I guess we'll start, if you have questions, go ahead and add them to the queue here. One of the questions that I got was, what do you find your challenge owners need, you know, that need the most help with? So I think, um, well, I'll answer first and then I'll let Ryan chime in to add, add or Ryan and Jeff to add anything. Um, I think uh, one of the things, sometimes it's helping articulate what their problem really is. 
because <laughs> uh, a lot of times, at least at NASA, we've seen that a lot of people maybe already have a solution in mind and they're just trying to get to that solution, right? But that isn't necessarily their problem. Like, <laughs> so it's almost backwards. So I, I think that first step of trying to articulate what their problem is, is, is probably one of the, the biggest things that they need help with. Because especially when you talk to people about crowdsourcing and challenges, um, people don't immediately say, oh, yeah, I've got a challenge. You know, they, they're like, oh, well, I don't have any challenges. And it's like, okay, do you have problems that you work on? Then, yes, you do have challenges. <laughs> we can, we right. can easily turn those into challenges. So, um, so, yeah, just articulating that piece, I think, is probably one of the, the biggest uh, – things that they need help with. Ryan or Jeff, do you have anything else to add? It was Ryan. I have one quick thing to add and then we can go Jeff, if you have anything. Um, even before that, um, I, I think making the assumption that um, people are challenge owners is often difficult in the first place, even mm -hmm. though, like Preston said, folks inevitably have challenges. They don't know how to get there. And that's a huge part. But also just convincing people that this platform is something that's worthy of using and convincing them that crowdsourcing open innovation are real and, and produce real results it is the first step a lot of times. So I, I think it's kind of twofold. It's both getting people to even know what we, know what we do and, and then believe that it's useful. And then once they get there, it's exactly what Carissa said. It's, it's helping them find what is your problem? How do we define it such that the community is going to be able to help you the most? Right. That makes sense. We've got a question here about um, how many campaigns do you recommend running at one time? especially when you first start using the tool? Does it depend on the size of the workforce? That's a great question. So we have found uh, that we only put probably two to four out a month. Um, so if you just look at a four week span, we try to limit it to two to four. And again, this is uh, kind of a best practice that we've seen uh, to not blood, <laughs> blood people's mailboxes, because like, uh, you know, because it's not just the challenge being out there, but it's also the communications that go with it. Um, you know, so really, two to four for us is, is a great number and has been kind of the number that we stick to. Um, so that it, it keeps new things coming, but it doesn't overpopulate the platform or flood the pl platform with too much at one time. Right. So the people don't get blind to the emails or the challenges. They get excited. Exactly. About them. Yeah. Exactly. We have somebody asking if you can go back to the LASSO acronym and talk. They said, um, you said the challenge should be able to be answered in one hour. And I, I think that was talking about how it has to be as limited in scope. Yes. Okay. So, um, so for us, for NASA at work, so this is a specific NASA at work thing. Um, so since we're a mixed workforce that, uh, that, uh, so we have civil servants and contractors, um, it, it's, it's a little touchy with people's time <laughs> and what they can be working on. And so for us, that one hour mark is, is kind of something that we've self, self-imposed, um, depending on, you know, this, the uh, the program or where you're working that might change um, in terms of, of the amount of time that someone can 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 work on a problem, um, but it still should be somewhat limited so that it's not such a such a broad problem where you know someone's spending like hours and hours and hours trying to, to trying to figure it out or has to to get a team together to to figure it out. I don't know if that helps answer the question. I think, I think that makes sense too. Like, and sometimes like you can piece out the challengeable part of a problem so that you don't have to say, you know, we're going to build this entire robot arm, right? That you can talk about the piece right. that you can work on in an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody wanted to know if you provided budgeting support for solving the challenge. We do not. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, unfortunately I would, I, so there's been many cases where we wish we could, but no, um, we do not. To, uh, provide any budgeting support it, it is it's really up to the technical teams um, and the funding that they have to go and pursue the ideas that they get from math at work that makes a lot of sense if I can add, our customer base too yeah mm -hmm. if, I, if I can add on to that real quick um, to also expand upon um, I think because it might be useful for the folks listening um, so we have NASA at work, which is free for our NASA employees to use, and we have other tools which aren't free. So part of our roadshow story, uh, the way we pretty much close it out is the, the action we give to those that are watching is to start preparing in their budgets 
um, utilizing open innovation tools as one of their tools in their toolboxes in order to accomplish their tasks. And so because we don't provide the, the, the budgeting for them or don't provide significant aid, they need to prepare, you know, in the government when they're planning a year ahead or whatever their number is, whatever their time frame is, to make sure that, oh, we can allocate this money to utilize open innovation if they have to break it down to that much. Well, and I, I'd imagine yeah. that that's one of the benefits of going with supported and owned as, the, as your criteria for launching mm -hmm. a challenge too, because generally those people are trying to solve problems with a budget and that way have some sort of budget for implementation too. Absolutely. Krista, you could speak to innovation calls. Yeah, so the other thing that we started doing, and this is somewhat new um, and doesn't follow LASSO necessarily uh, when we talk about challenges, but um, one thing that we've added to our NAS Network platform um, is the ability for people to put out an innovation call. So I don't know if other other organizations have this, but at NASA, we're notorious for putting out these calls for new ideas and, you know, there's money attached and some funding and, and things. And in the past, they, they've been these one-offs that happen at a particular center. Um, and, you know, there's not, there's not a concerted effort. So one of the things that we've tried to do since we have NASA at work as a centralized platform across the agency is also post innovation calls. So they're separate from challenges, so they don't follow our normal challenge process, but it's still a place where people that maybe do have funding for a particular idea and want ideas on uh, new things in a particular area can post on NASA work as well. So we already have a community that's engaged in innovation, um, so we thought it only made sense to also include things like this. So for those cases, we don't we don't provide the funding, but there is a group that um, that is providing some funding, and that's this is something that we've just started in the last uh, couple of months. We have a, a question too about the the road shows that you were talking about. How do you get funding to do a road show? Is what somebody wants to know. So I, I'll. I'll Take my best shot at answering, but part of our <laughs> charter, I guess, as our as an organization, is uh, also to educate uh, folks about what we do uh, in the open innovation space and crowdsourcing space. Uh, it's um, we have like pretty much part of our team's goal is to um, spread the word and also um, get more people using these tools, and they can't do that if they don't know about it. And so it's. Part of our daily job when we're not running challenges or when we're not you know working with a particular engagement already is to think about how can we increase our pipeline if, if that's something we need to do or how can we what messages do we need to get out to people and then there are lots of venues um, at our center and at other centers to um, to speak and so we'll try to tap into those as often as we can sometimes virtual uh, sometimes in person so it's really just kind of comes down to how our group runs Hopefully that answers it. I think so. Uh, we were somebody was asking about the moderators of the challenge, wondering if they help the challenge owner in converting unstructured information to more structured information. So for us, our moderators are part of the challenge owning team. Um, so there you usually are also technical experts or non-technical experts, but also are very aware of the problem. Um, so I, you know, I think as moderators, they, they, we, we suggest that they come in ideas, um, but we especially suggest that if they're, they're sitting ideas that are submitted that aren't necessarily, um, hitting the mark of what the challenge is asking, that they let them know and they, and then they tell them why, <laughs> you know, their idea isn't quite miss, uh, hitting the mark. So that, that whole dialogue, all of that engagement, super important, uh, for a successful challenge. We are also, somebody was asking about how do you t decide a topic can turn into a challenge? So you go from somebody with like a problem to solve to becoming a challenge sponsor. How do you evaluate mm -hmm. that? Um, so again, we take our, our challenge worksheet and we, we basically ask them to fill, fill out as much of the information as they can. So it, it speaks to the background, it speaks to things that they've tried and what they're looking to get out of running a challenge. Um, so all of that information 
it helps us determine what kind, what or if a challenge can be run um, with what they're looking for. I feel like maybe you sort of answered some of this question already, but uh, we've got some people here who are wondering what sort of infrastructure NASA uses to promote innovation or maybe open innovation too, specifically. That's a great question. So um, I'll take a shot at it and, and Jeff and Ryan, you can chime in as well. So we have, so, um, so NASA at work, so we've got a suite of things that can be considered crowdsourcing or open innovation tools. So we've got, We've got NASA Work, which is our internal to NASA platform. And then we have the other uh, center of excellence tools that engage the public, um, which mainly deal with curated crowds. You saw some of, the, some of them listed on that uh, menu, if you will, that we have. Um, but we also have other parts of NASA that are doing similar activities. So we've got a bunch of citizen science activities. Um, we've got uh, the Centennial Challenges that works a lot with uh, universities and other organizations to run really, really big, big challenges, um, uh, moonshot type activities. And so I think across these programs, we kind of have a suite. Yeah, we have NASA Solve. Jeff's really great at pulling up what, just what we need. <laughs> so you can learn about all these things on NASA Solve, but, but basically all of these things make up NASA Solve. And so it's kind of through the efforts of all these different groups that we've gotten the word out on open innovation. And, uh, and again, it's the human network. It's, it's doing things like roadshows to different organizations, um, internal and external to NASA, talking about what we do um, that I think has really probably made the biggest impact um, in getting the word out. I don't know if Ryan or Jeff, you have other things to add? I think the main point is just like everyone else, we're trying to get it adopted as well. <laughs> yeah, it's been eight years, but you know, it's 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 still we're still continuing <laughs> with adoption. I think it's become, you know, dare I say, more mainstream now. But it's still, you know, we're still always fighting to uh, to have a pipeline of challenges talking to folks. Um, right. So it's never ending. Yeah, you guys wear a lot of ha hats. You're curators. You're like, you know projectors, your evangelists, and your Sherpas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think- And that's our whole team of like six people. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, there you, oh, I see you there on the right-hand side. That's awesome. Well, I think we've run up against the end of our time. So I, I feel like you've got a lot of really great story here and a lot of rich information. And for those of you who felt like you want to hear more, or learn more, this is a really great preview of uh, what they're going to be sharing at Open Nation. So hopefully we'll see you there as well. Again, follow up with any questions you have. And thank you so much, Carissa, Ryan, and Jeff for putting together this great presentation. Thank you guys. You thank bet. You thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.